Thank you. Uh, and, and thanks for coming. This is the first time uh, for me in this beautiful facility. And thank you so much to Quinnipiac University. Uh, it's great to get a chance to see this. I taught at Quinnipiac down the road for years and years, and it's good to see them grow in this way. Um, we are going to have a, a really great conversation. And the conversation is about collaboration. I should just start by saying that uh, for about the last year and a half, I've been part of a collaborative project with NPR and with member stations around the country. And what that means is that I'm going down to Washington, D.C. often, and I'm meeting with um, colleagues there and colleagues from around the country about how member stations of NPR and NPR itself can better collaborate. And you might hear that and say, my goodness, I thought they did that already. And the fact is, is that even though we all have the same mission and we're all in the same business, collaboration is really hard. But when you do it really well, it works and it helps to, to save money and it helps to drive innovation. And I'm really excited to talk to folks here who are not only interested in the ideas of collaboration, but, but show it in practice. You have in your programs uh, extensive bios of these folks uh, so that I, I can just quickly get to them. But I want to welcome uh, Diane Hasselman, uh, Ben Bynum, and also Amy Latham. Thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll start with you first, Diane. And why don't you just tell me a bit about the work that you do? Just give us a, an overview. So, um, so I represent about 35. They're called regional health improvement collaboratives. They're scattered all across the country. Um, they are private, nonprofit organizations, and they are the conveners, the trusted conveners within their communities and their states, bringing together all of the different stakeholders, and there are, there are many, many stakeholders in healthcare, bringing them together to a common table and a conversation to tackle some of the really um, difficult and challenging questions that we face in healthcare um, around quality, around cost, um, around the community's priorities and needs. And um, so these organizations that I work with, these regional health improvement collaboratives, are bringing those folks to the table, um, having these challenging conversations, keeping folks at the table, and hopefully facilitating transformation and reform of health and health care in their communities and their states as a result. So that, in a nutshell, is, um, is what we do at the, the Network for Regional Health Care Improvement. Give me an example of one of these challenging conversations. So a challenging conversation, and we've heard many of them already um, this morning, um, how much are we spending? What's the total cost of care per capita in our community? Um, how does that compare with other communities, either within our state or in other states? Um, and what does that look like? And are we okay with that? And are we okay as a community that our healthcare costs are going up and crowding out, as the previous panel said, uh, education costs, um, costs for infrastructure in our community? Um, those are the challenging conversations, um, if that gives you a sense of, of, of what we do. And give me maybe one example of a collaboration of, of these many that you pull together that, that works. Just a snapshot so that we understand. So I, I think, um, God, there, there are so many. I think um, in Oregon, uh, they do exceptional work around collaboration. Minnesota does amazing work. Um, Maine does amazing work, Louisiana. I mean, they're really scattered all across the, the country. They are each very organic because they're, they're locally based. They're locally driven. They reflect the, the marketplace. Uh, they reflect the leadership. They reflect the community. Um, and they are often very data driven. So regional collaboratives might be all payer claims databases where they can identify what costs are, what utilization is like, what quality is like, and can, can, can drill down and focus in on some of those issues, like readmissions, uh, uh, avoidable readmissions to a hospital, inappropriate use of the emergency department, um, starting to get into some of those, those issues. Is, is data becoming easier all the time, or is there so much data that it's, um, that, that it's hard for you? Uh, great question. Um, 
I think it is becoming easier. It's slow going. Um, I think access to all all payer claims databases and um, all of the, all payers putting their claims into a common place. I think that's becoming um, more um, more commonplace. I think it's still challenging. I think getting clinical data, so there are different types of data you want to access. That's very challenging. And then incorporating the two claims and clinical data to get a really full picture of of quality and and of costs. That is the um, that, that is still out there. We're, we're moving <laughs> toward it, but it's incredibly challenging. Mm. Ben, how about you? Tell us a little bit about the work that you do. Sure. Uh, I sit as Director of Operations at Vital Healthcare Capital. Uh, VCAP is a nonprofit, uh, $100 million uh, social investment loan fund where we invest in projects across the country that do two things socially. Uh, one is bring high quality integrated healthcare services to underserved patient populations. But then secondly, uh, each project that we finance uh, must have a good jobs mission in terms of uh, frontline healthcare, healthcare workers, uh, real roles on the care team, uh, respected roles, and then allowing them to kind of capture that in a better job quality. Uh, as a fund, we work with foundations, we work with some of the larger banks, some of the foundations we've partnered with. Robert Wood Johnson, Kellogg, uh, the Ford Foundation, Rockefeller. Uh, we also partner with some of the larger banks, Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, and then some corporations that have what they call uh, impact investing or community benefits arms and Kaiser, Dignity Health, MetLife Insurance. And we kind of cobble those sources of income or revenue together create what we call VCAP, our loan fund, and then we go across the country investing in projects that fit both our health care and our good jobs mission. Why, why is the work that you're doing so important right now in the, in the current healthcare landscape? Well, there's so much changing, uh, both on the practice transformation side, the payment, payment reimbursement sort of reform side, and for larger, well-resourced health systems, it's not a problem. You know, I have enough money in the cushion of my couch to figure out sort of what goes on here. <laughs> uh, for those providers that serve patients that we deem sort of safety net type patients, they may not be as well resourced. And what we want to do at VCAP is be a resource that supports uh, whatever financial challenges sort of stand in the way of you going from where you are now and bridging yourself to sort of where you want to be. Give us an example of a project, just the one that comes to the top of your head that you would want to tell people about, one that really, in your mind, illustrates what you're talking about. Sure. Uh, we provided a $10 million financing to a uh, nonprofit integrated health plan, and I call them that because they take uh, capitated risk for dual eligibles, but then they also have some clinical capacity, primarily on the outpatient ambulatory care side. And in the face of a new CMS duals pilot, this uh, nonprofit insurance plan who organically over a 10 year time frame had uh, about 5,000 members, but through this new CMS pilot had the ability to scale up and take their model to 20, 25 times. So we're talking four or five X growth. Mm -hmm. Where traditionally over that 10 year time span, uh, they just had enough operational surplus to kind of support whatever growth needs they may they may have had at the time. But to kind of do that, that hockey stick level growth of 5,000 members to 20,000 members, they just did not have enough internal capital to support that level of growth. So we partnered with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, and then made an investment in this particular organization. And I think for us, that kind of fits where we want to be. Uh, one is, uh, I'm a former college athlete, so forgive my, my slang, it's skating to where the puck is going. So providers that are looking out saying, where's practice transformation going? Where's reimbursement going? That's where I need to go. Uh, but then also doing that in the face of a federal program that has some, some, some touch and some movement to it. Uh, but then also partner with philanthropy and bringing some philanthropic dollars to the kind of transactions we do. Uh, is sort of the sweet spot we want to be. Is part of what you're doing explaining to these philanthropic groups and some of these foundations what it is you're, you, you want to do, what it is you're talking about? Absolutely. I, I think it's about kind of bringing everyone together on the same page. Uh, I think depending on who you're talking to, it could be much more of a programmatic kind of public health uh, feel 
and then you could be at a different meeting five minutes later and it's much more about the financing pieces and structuring and some of payment repayment options and things of that nature so uh, depending on who's on the other side of the table and I'm in some of these meetings with the CFO the chief medical officer and the strategy person so you may be having all three of the conversations mm -hmm. together yeah. so it, it really all depends on sort of who's the audience that you that you're sort of speaking with mm. Amy, how about you? Give us an overview of the work you do. Sure. First, um, thank you so much for the invitation to be here with you today. Um, this is a wonderful event, and I am excited to be here, not just to share a little bit about Colorado, um, but also to learn from you all. So thank you to Universal Healthcare Foundation and to Jill and Francis for the invitation. I am Amy Latham. I'm the Interim Vice President for Philanthropy at the Colorado Health Foundation. So um, we get the chance to work with Jill and Francis and uh, colleagues from around the country on um, conversations like this. Um, our interest, our vision, is that together with our partners, we will make Colorado the healthiest state in the nation. And we would love to share that in a two-way tie with Connecticut. So <laughs> um, we, we are a very large health foundation for a state the size of Colorado. Uh, Colorado has a population of about 5 million. And because Felicia mentioned it earlier, I'll say we're also very large in terms of land mass. So about 108,000 square miles, um, 5 million people, most, most of whom are concentrated in what we call the front range of Colorado. Um, so geographically very different um, from Connecticut and yet still grappling, I think, with a lot of the same issues that I hear being discussed today. Uh, we fund in the areas of health care, health coverage, and healthy living. So we have um, goals in each one of those areas and also look a lot at the intersections between those areas. Um, because again, our, our vision is um, broader than just the health care system. It really is about how we can create health for all the residents of Colorado. Um, I, and I would just say as a caveat that, that the perspective that I'll bring to today's panel is really as a funder. So we um, have the opportunity to um, support collaboratives across the state. Um, and I can share some examples that I think um, might be interesting for folks here today. But we also participate in collaborations across the state and um, am glad to be able to share some of the lessons that we've learned as a participant in those collaborations as well. Maybe talk first about a, a collaboration that you support that you'd like to highlight. You bet. Uh, there, there are so many, um, so many good ones happening in Colorado at the local and the regional level. Um, and I'm going to talk about one that Jill and I didn't discuss beforehand. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go rogue a little bit, but I think it's an interesting one um, for the purposes of this conversation, and it is um, the Pueblo Triple Aim Project. So Pueblo is a city of about 100,000 people um, in the southern part of Colorado. Um, they have um, uh, very high health care needs and tremendous disparities in their community. And um, they have embarked upon a really innovative collaboration focused on the triple aim of health care, which I'm sure everyone in this room is very familiar with, what that, that refers to, better population health, better patient experience of care, and a lower per capita cost um, of health care. And they took a really interesting approach. Um, they started by getting... Um, folks from different sectors to sit down together, and I mean local public health, hospitals, providers, insurance plans, um, the, the um, county government officials, schools, lots of different folks around a table. And they started talking about what the system looks like in their community. And um, not just healthcare delivery, but what delivers health in that community, what creates health in that community. And they used a tool called um, Rethink Health. Is anyone here familiar with Rethink Health? Um, to really look at the resources in the community of Pueblo and, and what levers, if they decided to collectively pull together, would have the greatest impact on the health outcomes they were seeking to achieve. So they used Rethink Health as <coughs> a convening tool as a way to start developing joint strategies, and then um, talk about, well, what are sustainable financing models then, if that's the path that we want to go down. Um, and they are a couple of years in. They are really working together well, I think, um, starting to see some innovative projects and identifying that really if they want to impact the health of their community, the best thing they can do is to go upstream. Um, the impact on the health of their community is, um, is kind of the greatest when you go the furthest upstream and start talking about high school graduation rates and reducing teen pregnancy and smoking cessation and early childhood kind of issues. How does that uh, jibe, I suppose, with some of what you were telling me you do, Diane? 
Uh, I mean, very much. I mean, the, the um, ideas of collaboration, of looking outside of the healthcare system, which is what, 10 to 20 percent of, of a healthy population, and everything else uh, is, it, uh, makes people um, actually healthy communities um, thrive. So um, this is, um, so I think you're getting kind of into population health, which, and the kind of the culture of health, um, and um, regional collaboratives, I think historically have been focused on, and I think much of, much of the healthcare system has been focused on traditional kind of medical care. Um, and what's happening within the four walls of the healthcare practice, and that that is changing dramatically. Um, regional collaboratives are now expanding from having the physician, hospitals, consumer, employer at the table to now saying, well, schools should be involved, and well, what about jobs, and what about food and access to to fresh food, and and so this is this is new territory. I think it is um, important to cover. It's, it's new relationships. It's figuring out new ways to, to measure outcomes and progress. And where do you get that data? And, and who has it? And um, what, what do we really want to measure? What is important to us as a, as a community? Mm -hmm. um, it may be very different than what we traditionally have been measuring in the healthcare system. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I think it relates immensely. Yeah. Um, and we're going to have time, as we did in the previous panel, for you to ask questions near the end. But there's a lot of questions that we wanted to get to. And some of what, what we've heard so far, it, it, it sounds like it's not easy, but um, it's possible to get stakeholders who share some of the same um, end goals and interests and priorities aligned. H how do you get stakeholders into the same room or aligned when maybe they don't have so, some of the same priorities? I mean, maybe I'll start with you, Ben, but I think it's, uh, it's, that's part of the, the, the tough road we have? Well, I think it, it, it is a discussion to be had, but I think the challenge is figuring out where are the overlapping priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, we're now as an as a organization working uh, at the state level in Colorado with uh, their SIM program and a couple of uh, potential payers, uh, the foundation, um, the state SIM model sort of office, uh, really around figuring out how do we support uh, practices that are trying to integrate physical health and behavioral health? And that's kind of the, the banner of SIM in Colorado. Uh, and people come at it from different angles, you know, talking to the payers about how do we get an enhanced payment for folks that are doing this kind of integrative care delivery. You know, talking to the foundation about how do we make sure that uh, the less resource practices that want to do this uh, there is a source of res there is a, a source of uh, financing or some type of support for them to do that. Uh, also, talking to sort of the state about uh, what workforce challenges will have to be solved in order for a physical health clinic to understand the sensitivities that a mental health clinic may have to understand, or you may have a mental health clinic that has to kind of deal with what are the physical pieces that if we integrate physical health here, what are the challenges that we should sort of be. Uh, expecting. So I think it's really about one kind of having that common goal, but then being able to put a lens on it depending on who you're talking to and who you're trying to move such that it 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 sort of hits their pain point, okay. but then ultimately brings everyone kind of central to that that key goal you want everyone sort of focused on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I think it you know, what gets stakeholders aligned differs community by community, is my guess. Um, and I think I can think of a couple, and maybe they're on a continuum. Um, but a lot, a lot, it depends on the level of trust that exists in a community or among the, the stakeholders already, the history of collaboration. Um, but given that, I think that data is one way to get people aligned. Um, and it's important that it be local data or it be data that reflects the experience of that community. I think um, even state level data when you're talking about community level collaborations is not relevant to the stakeholders in a community. You really have to get data at a very granular level to engage stakeholders on the issues. Opportunity. So Ben mentioned the state innovation model grant in Colorado. That's a huge opportunity for the state. And that, that is um, a chance to get stakeholders aligned because they want to seize that opportunity and make the most of it. And then Felicia mentioned earlier a burning platform. I think that 
can be the most compelling, um, but if there's truly just urgency to a situation and something that just cannot go on, cannot be sustained, there is opportunity in that um, environment to get people aligned. Mm -hmm. Diane, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add, the, I think the other piece is, is leadership, and at the risk yeah. of getting a little uh, touchy-feely here, I, I think, again, that is so critical. And, and in the communities that, that I work with, where the leadership is very strong and not only can get the right people to the table, but can keep yeah. them there when the conversations when get slow. tense. And these are, again, this is, these are inherently intended to be tense conversations because if you're not having tense conversations, you're not, you're, you're not really having a lot at stake. But these leaders are um, incredibly respectful. Um, they're incredibly good listeners. They understand that all of the different stakeholders in healthcare, the hospital executive, the health plan, the patient, the, the PCP, the specialist, they all have very valid concerns um, and we are all contributing to this and we need each other to figure this out collectively. So they get that. Um, they invest time uh, in, in those relationships um, it's not an afterthought, it is an investment, and those relationships hopefully pay off over time um, in, in the trust factor. And the, the quote that John said in the yeah. previous panel, um, that change happens at the, at the speed of trust, is, uh, is absolutely um, first and foremost. I, I think the other thing that these leaders just completely, purely believe is that we can go further, faster, um, together. And I know that sounds a little bit hokey, but um, collectively, <laughs> we, again, we need each other. There are so many stakeholders um, that, and, and it's not about shame, it's not about blame. It's about finding win-win um, situations um, and, um, and taking your time to figure out a plan as a community of the, the, the best way to move forward. Not, not an endless time frame, uh, um, but to be planful and thoughtful and bring people along in the process. I, and I'm sure it's different in every community, but who are these leaders? Mm -hmm. From what sector do they come? Um, it's a great question. They, they are um, from, from healthcare. Uh, many have backgrounds as um, nurses, as physicians. Some are, um, have business backgrounds and come from the um, uh, employer community. Um, but it, it, it's almost, um, it, clearly having uh, deep substantive and, and content knowledge about health and healthcare is important, but, but it's kind of those intangible leadership qualities um, that are so critical to collaboration and um, uh, kind of that, that's the secret sauce from, from my perspective. I would agree with that. And I would add, I think one of the, it, it's important to have representation from the different um, organizations and sectors that are involved and impacted. Um, as important, I think, are people who are not just powerful, you know, leaders of their own organizations, but I think as Diane was describing, people who see the system and can think about the system, um, even in healthcare where it's not so much a system in um, many cases, who can see, see and think about a system and stewardship of that system. And that's a really, I think it's a really different set of leadership skills than what we typically think of someone who's a, a great leader of their organization. And I think, I know we'll, we'll get to challenges, that can be a challenge when you have um, people around a table who are wonderful leaders of their individual organizations, but maybe aren't able as easily to take off that hat and think about stewardship of a, of a common resource, which is the system. Can, can those leaders come from uh, the government sector? Should they in, come from the government sector in leading these collaborators, Ben, do you think? Uh, I think government has to play a part in it, uh, particularly um, you know, Medicaid and payers of Medicare. Uh, and then also the SIM program, Colorado particularly has theirs kind of housed under the umbrella of the governor's office. So uh, I think just because of the nature of health care and the nature of the beast, that government has to be at the table in some sense. It, it has to be at the table. Does it do a good job being at the table in, in leading these collaboratives, Amy? <laughs> well, I learned Definitely earlier that, that this is being recorded. So. <laughs> um, I, I, here's, 
here's one observation. I'd be interested to hear what everyone else has to say about this. But I think it's important that government be at the table. Government has to be at the table. And I think everyone has to acknowledge, just as every organization around the table, government has constraints. And so in terms of a collaboration and building that trust, I think acknowledging what those constraints are and how you're showing up and how you're participating is really important. Mm. Yeah, please. Yeah, I guess I would add to that. So, so sometimes um, uh, with policy or, or legislation, you know, mandates can be very helpful. They are shortcuts to getting it done, but they are not consensus, and mm -hmm. they shouldn't be kind of confused um, as such. Um, I think state governments are incredibly um, important partners. Um, the previous panel listed all sorts of of. Uh, unique levers that state governments have that the, the private sector um, doesn't. So I, I think um, it's important to have them at the table. I mean, they, they are often the largest employer um, in their state, and as such, they wield tremendous purchasing power um, to really advance value-based purchasing and, and, and other efforts. Um, I, I think as long as they come to the table as um, one uh, kind of purchaser or, or just one stakeholder, they are not the dominant one. And they, um, I think, could learn so much from other purchasers around the table and, and um, providers who are on the ground um, doing this work day in, day out, um, patients and families. So they're critical to have at the, at the table, um, um, absolutely. I, I'm wondering, I'll go to you first, Ben. How do you get consumers to the table as stakeholders, right? We're talking about high-level, influential stakeholders, including government and, and leaders in, in organizations from various sectors, but getting consumers there so that we can start to collaborate with them as well. How do you do that? Uh, it's an interesting question, particularly from the way I come at it, um, and from VCAP. But I think, you know, one of the most important things that we like to look for is you know, providers that are uh, out in the community uh, waiting on a 75-year-old lady with comorbid illnesses to show up at your clinic at 2.30 and have an appointment, it's great. But if you could actually take that appointment to her at 2.30 in her home, that's, that's a different kind of model. Mm -hmm. So we like to really talk through and work with providers that are doing sort of community-based models, whether it's home health, whether it's school-based, whether it's a mobile clinic that goes to homeless shelters on Tuesdays. Uh, but we're always at VCAP fascinated by providers that kind of break down the four-wall silo and take the care to the patient versus waiting for the patient to come to the care. And it, it helps to get the care to the patient, but I assume that the provider also learns an awful lot in the process, right? That you learn a lot more by being in the community providing care than you do by waiting for people to come in and being within your four walls. Absolutely, and it, it's, it, it's uh, depending on where you are, this could be easily done. I mean, I talk to some of the folks in the mountains in Colorado, it's a bit different versus somebody that's in rural Colorado versus New York City where we build up instead of out. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it, you know, it depends on where you are. Sometimes one model makes sense in one geographic location. You take that model to another geographic location. It just doesn't quite work the same. So I think having uh, a really good understanding of what are the pain points of the patients you're trying to serve and how do you tailor a solution to that particular challenge more so than a one size fits all is kind of where we, where we like to go. Yeah. Could you talk a bit more about the, you know, getting consumers to the table? Sure. I, um, it's critically important to making sure that we have a healthcare system that works for all, that consumers be part of the conversation. Um, I think we get them there by, as a funder, insisting that they be there, insisting that they be part of that conversation. I think being very intentional about how, how to engage consumers, that consumers must be engaged, and how, and how they're engaged is as I said, critically important. The other thing that I think is really important is to um, prepare consumers and their advocates to participate in those conversations successfully. And so I applaud the work of Families USA and Consumers Union and other groups that are really thinking about how to support consumer advocacy organizations to participate in these very different conversations, very different from talking about coverage expansion. The language, the frame, the, the um, I mean, everything is different about the, who you're talking to, um, all different. And so requires different skills 
skills, and I think um, it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we we are both engaging consumers, but speaking from a funder's perspective, that we empower those representatives of consumers to be successful in those conversations and representing their constituents. Diane? So one of the requirements of being a regional health improvement collaborative is to have a, a consumer on your governing board. Um, and, and having their presence automatically changes changes mm -hmm. the dynamic and changes the conversation. I think preparation is absolutely um, critical, as Amy said. Um, uh, our Detroit um, collaborative has a speakers bureau mm -hmm. where they work with consumers to actually go out and present to um, hospitals and present to employers um, about healthcare. And I mean, the amount of of training and support that goes into that. Healthcare is such a complex topic. And then to not only grasp the, the content and, and the message clearly, but to do it in a way that, um, that is, is, is respectful and is calm, even though as a patient sometimes you might be seething inside and, and feel that there's an injustice, there's, a, there's a, a way to communicate that message so that people will hear it and will, and will let it in. And so I think there's a lot of work. There's another uh, wonderful initiative called Choosing Wisely. It's by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and it's in many states across the country and I think it's also in Connecticut. Um, and they do a, a great job focusing on communities and kind of how do you change the hearts and minds of consumers to feel comfortable asking questions of, of providers about overuse of care or inappropriate use? Do I, do I really need to have that, that service? Um, and so changing the conversation that providers and, and patients can have. Um, we're, we're actually hosting on Tuesday a conversation with one of the leading consumers um, uh, from Minnesota uh, from a, an organization called Baby Boomers for Balanced Healthcare. <laughs> and he's gonna, be, he's gonna talk about, um, in choosing wisely, how do you message to the baby boomer generation about healthcare and, and their role in it. So, so, so you've both talked to, to a certain extent about training consumers to actually work within the system. What about you know, uh, training for the providers to you know, let the consumer in a little bit? <laughs> that, that's, a, that's great. That's also very much a part of the Choosing Wisely initiative. It's one targeted partly at the community and the other at the, at the provider and the delivery system. So, and I think a lot of that is around, um, it, it's certainly kind of using data as a way to open the door to that conversation. And providers are just love data and, and love information and love analysis and, and seeing how their performance compares to their peers and, and then collaborating about it and saying, well, how did, how did you get those results? And I'm working just down the hall from you how are you doing this? Mm -hmm. um, we, we see similar patients. Mm -hmm. We work in a similar work environment. Um, how does that happen? So, and so facilitating and, and supporting that information exchange and, and helping providers um, understand strategies and giving them the tools so that they don't have to um, be uh, distraught if their quality scores are, are, are less than their peers because there's an opportunity and support to improve them and improve improve the care they deliver. Mm. And, and what about providing for uh, consumer diversity in some of these collaborations too? We, we know so much about how uh, there are broad health disparities for people of color. Maybe you can talk about that, Amy. I'd like to hear from all of our panelists, but I think that's important. Absolutely, it's a, it's a critically important issue. And I, again, just speaking from the perspective of a funder, one of the things that I think is, is our job is to make sure that we are supporting a diverse network of consumer advocacy organizations, um, groups that represent <laughs> communities of color, groups that represent older people or people with disabilities um, to participate in those conversations. Because again, if the goal is a healthcare system that works for everybody, for all, um, we, don't, we don't have a chance of that if we're not engaging all of those um, communities and populations um, in these conversations. So um, it's critically important. I think it is um, you know, something that we're very intentional about is who's at the table and who are they representing and are they, are they um, authentically representing that group? You know, there are some groups that say we represent everybody, but really understanding, well, how do you, how do you actually represent kind of the views of 
um, the people on the street, the real people involved in this uh, in these issues every day of their lives. How are you engaging them, and how are you us asking the questions? I think is a, is a really important first step. Yeah, Ben. Uh, really, for us, you know, we're mandated both by our sort of uh, charter, by our board, by our loan committee, quite frankly, by some of our funders, that our dollars have to be put to work in low-income communities. Mm -hmm. So for us, the challenge is really finding uh, deals that fit both our healthcare mission and our jobs mission and it'll show well to our funder community as well as sort of the impact investing community. Uh, so it's a challenge we accept, a challenge we're excited about, uh, but just by the nature of us doing our work, uh, we're in low-income communities trying to have an impact there. Could, could, you, could you talk about the jobs piece of it in low-income sure, communities? Sure, sure, that's sure. really important, too. Um, I'll take the first uh, transaction we did, which was the loan to the integrated care plan. Uh, and traditionally in their state, uh, they work with a lot of dual eligibles who are folks that are typically in the home. And they service this group through home, home, home care aides, personal care aides, depending on sort of who you're talking about there. And uh, one of the challenges that they saw as an organization, as a health plan, was that although the health, home health aide may have been in uh, the home 40, 50 hours a week with this particular patient, when the patient had an acute care issue and was admitted to the hospital, then the home health aide was kept out of that environment. Mm. And through our funding, uh, they piloted a program where as patients got admitted into the acute care setting, the home health aide was now brought in and made a member of the acute care team, mm -hmm. such that that home health aide could be skilled in the acute care setting, get some team-based learning such that when that patient was then discharged back home, well, now the home health aide had a bit more skills to kind of bring to the table. And they were allowed to capture that improved um, sort of health engagement mm -hmm. through better job quality. So for us, that's really kind of where we want to play, uh, working with that kind of frontline healthcare worker, finding real roles on the care team, having them valued for bringing that new level of skills, and then capturing that new level of skills and job quality. Mm -hmm. Did you have a thought thing? I do, yeah. So, so from re the regional collaborative perspective, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of how one community is dealing um, with disparities, and that's in Minnesota, um, but other communities do this. They're, they're actually stratifying and looking at quality measures and outcomes by race, ethnicity, and language. And, and, so, and then using those results, and again, just to, to put them out there and say, let's, let's see what's happening and let's have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. Let's um, try to come up with some solutions um, to address these disparities. So let's not wash them away by, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, adjust, you know, by risk adjusting them. Let's, let's look at what the reality is and then let's have a conversation about what we see and let's, let's figure it out. And what does that figuring out look like? I mean, get, get, take us a little deeper into this. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, um, I think um, a lot of it is uh, engaging uh, closely with the state Medicaid agency. They are a terrific um, partner and have actually supported that work. So I, I think that's part of it. I think part of it is having community forums and conversations. Again, I know that sounds really touchy feely, but I think that's what so much of um, healthcare transformation is about. It's, it's, it's about the cultural change as a country and as communities. Um, wh what do we want to see in our healthcare system? What should it look like? What should equity look like? Mm -hmm. I think part of it is also um, giving providers the supports, the um, tools, the information that they need to help um, manage um, populations that are more complex. And I think this ties great, very well to, to Ben's point, whereas, um, you know, pulling in community health workers mm -hmm. um, and um, bringing in social service providers so that the, the PCP, the primary care provider, doesn't feel like he or she is all by him or herself trying to um, support, treat, help, direct, manage, coordinate the care of, of very complex patients. Yeah. I, I agree, and I would I would say I think it's this the figuring it out is really about going upstream and making connections outside of the clinic walls, um, including um, public health agencies, because part of what um, you know a primary care provider is dealing with a certain segment of the population and they're seeing certain incidences. But if you can add that data up at a community level, 
public health is trained to see those patterns and to say, well, why are we seeing asthma in this particular neighborhood, in this particular building? What's going on there from an environmental perspective that we as public health can address? So I think the figuring it out is all about going outside of the clinic walls and really looking at it from those upstream factors and um, those community-based organizations, those social service organizations, public health, that, that can help figure out what's going on and what's driving those disparities. And to, to, to piggyback on Amy's point, you know, we've had conversations with health plans who uh, receive sort of this capitated payment from both Medicare and Medicaid. And, they noticed in a couple of their elderly patients uh, who seemed to be a bit depressed and were having some health outcomes kind of out of whack. Uh, and for them, they sat down and had a conversation with this group and figured out uh, they couldn't get to church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So this health plan actually operates a church van to go and pick up elderly women to take them to church, improve their depression scores, mm -hmm. improve their health outcomes. And for them, it's a social issue yep but it directly ties into yeah. health impacts and then healthcare costs for payers. So, you know, thinking about what other social mm -hmm. issues that could be um, both positive or even negatively impacting kind of health outcomes is something that we should, we should, we should also sort of have top of mind. Yeah. I, and I can't speak for the, all the states that you folks work in, but I can certainly speak for Connecticut and say that um, that issue wouldn't be thought of as a health issue in a lot of places in mm -hmm. Connecticut. Is that fair to say? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that that's, a, that's a, an incredible example because it clearly has an impact, right? Yeah. Yeah. But there's, there'd be some different uh, department looking at it, there'd be some different philanthropy looking at it, and, and we wouldn't connect the dots. Well, and one of the panelists mentioned earlier, it's, it's the reimbursement giving you the flexibility to be able to address some of the social issues and not this encounter base, you know, 15 minutes, next room 15 minutes, next room 15 minutes, just this churning of patients versus actually figuring out what's really going on, but then having a reimbursement model that supports me and gives me the flexibility to be able to address some of those social issues who quite frankly are running up my healthcare costs. Sure. Yeah. I would I would add to that, in addition to the reimbursement, I think it really is about broadening the conversation. And um, we have a new CEO who just started a couple a month ago, and she's been on a tour around Colorado. Her goal is to set foot in every county of Colorado in like the first three months or something. So, it, and we're headed into winter, so it's going to be an interesting um, couple of weeks here. But um, it, her point is that health is everybody's business. It's not just the doctors, it's not just the clinics, it's obviously government, but it's the school, it's transportation, it's banking and finance, it's everybody's business and we have to start, if our goal is, if our goal is a healthcare system that works, that's one thing and that's a noble and laudable goal, but if our goal is health, for the population, we have to broaden the conversation because um, people not being able to get to church on Sunday, feeling isolated, leading to depression, um, that is a health issue. That again, if you if you broaden that conversation, you get those partners to the table, they would, you know, if you broaden that conversation um, enough, they would be able to tell you that that's why you're seeing this increase in depression, right? And here are some ways that we can solve that. When you talk about transportation, for, for instance, I mean, you have to align incentives, right? Yeah. You have to bring these stakeholders to the table and you have to somehow align their incentives so that it, it makes sense for them because they may have exactly. very different goals in mind, right? Exactly. And I think that's why the reimbursement conversation is so important and has to be just kind of saddled up right next to this conversation is how do we change the incentives and the reimbursement and the healthcare system so that we can get to we can invest in those interventions that actually achieve greater health yeah. instead of more health care. Just very quickly, you had mentioned earlier that, about the value of, of public health data and, and how that's collected, but you'd also said earlier that sometimes statewide is, is too broad and getting down to the local level. I mean, how, how hard is it to, to do that, to get local level public health data that you can use and that your, your uh, collaborators can use? 
I think that's a challenge. I mean, that's a big challenge. And I don't know how that is in Connecticut and Colorado. That's a big challenge. Um, we have a couple of- I hear nervous laughter. Yeah, right. So that must be, it must be a challenge. Um, but I think as granu granular as you can get the data, um, that is really important. We do have an all-payer claims database in Colorado. And we also have a biennial um, household survey that we can use that gets us to some level of granularity um, with the data. And I think the challenge now is, is making sense of the data and tying those different pieces together. Diane mentioned earlier, tying the claims data to the clinical data and painting a picture that actually makes sense and people can take action um, based upon is the next step. Go, please. Sorry, you said that Colorado, you, you struggle with it. You, I think you actually are doing a, an amazing job. You, you do have an APCD and you are able in Colorado to look at the regional variation yeah. of um, you know, PCPs to, to residents, yeah. you know, county by county, um, costs. Um, you're doing, I, th I think, amazing work in Colorado. And it's it's been, I appreciate hearing that because I think we all, as good as, as it is, maybe relative to other states, it's not enough yet, I think, for providers. There's still a thirst for data for providers and others, but we do have, you're absolutely right, a, a APCD that is um, very high functioning and really starting to yield actionable data. I heard a story the other day of someone um, again, this speaks to the power of collaboration. Um, we had a multi-payer collaborative that came together and funded a tool that sits on top of our all-payer claims database. And um, someone was demoing this for a provider and actually able to show this provider among their patient population what was happening with certain of his patients kind of outside of his clinic. This woman has been in the ER four times in the yep. past three months and he had no idea. And so, you know, was able to take that information, make an action plan for reaching out to specific people in his panel. So we're just starting to yield some of the benefits, I think, of that data. Awesome. Yeah. Before we go to questions from our audience, I, I, I should ask you, Ben, how do we find money to do all this great stuff? <laughs> A lot of begging. Yeah, it's a lot <laughs> of I definitely don't have it. So find, a, find us some money in the next minute or two. Well, time. we um, as an organization have uh, been really successful in going out and capitalizing what we're calling our loan fund. Uh, and we work with foundations who make grants and PRIs, program-related investments, who align with their, with their mission. And folks make grants to us along our sort of health care uh, mission where we want to bring services to the underserved or the jobs mission where we want to create good jobs in low-income communities. Uh, on the bank side, a lot of the large banks have CRA, Community Reinvestment Act, obligations where they have to put a percentage of their balance sheet to work in low-income communities. And instead of them going out and doing that, they partner with nonprofit uh, investors such as us and then count our investments towards their CRA type of band-aids. And then on the corporate side, where a lot of the, you know, maybe not a lot, a few of the Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies, they operate this community uh, benefit or impact investing uh, programs where uh, they take a little bit of the operational surplus and then want to go out and do good. Uh, sometimes for PR reasons, sometimes it's a genuine reason, uh, but ultimately that's sort of how we, how we get the partnerships there. Uh, so it's either one, just mission alignment with a lot of sort of philanthropic bodies, uh, two, the government sort of mandates some of the big banks kind of do this type of lending, and then lastly, some of the large corporations just want to operate kind of that feel-good piece of a business, mm. and they kind of partner with folks like us to, to do some of that work. In the world of PR, everything is a genuine reason. <laughs> I'll leave that one yeah. off. I should record hey, that one. Hey, any other thoughts about, about raising funds for this? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so um, <coughs> a, a few thoughts. So a lot of these collaboratives are um, have uh, grant funding. So the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has been uh, a, a terrific support of regional collaboratives uh, through the Aligning Forces for Quality program uh, that recently uh, just ended. That was a very um, helpful way to uh, to create the infrastructure and support to bring multi-stakeholder collaboratives together and to get them uh, started or to, to strengthen them. I think, though, the collaboratives that are really successful and sustainable are very entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. and they are looking for opportunities to support, uh, to support state government. Some of them have federal grants. Um, but basically, they might be appealing to employers in their community and trying to develop the tools that are valued by employers or by health plans or by providers. So 
That's critical. I, I, I think uh, I would also be remiss to leave out the support of regional philanthropies. And even if they are not as large as uh, national ones, um, they are critical to providing even a little bit of support you know, to, to bring on a, a, you know, a half-time executive director or something just to, to start a regional collaborative in a state that might not have one. Do you have a quick thought, Amy, before we go to questions? Yeah, I, th I think grant funding is essential. And I think, um, you know, um, if you're going to do it, John said earlier, if you're, um, if you're going to, to do it, be successful, um, which I think is important, um, particularly if you want to sustain grant funding and sustain your success and expand your sources of support, um, but probably as important, if you're going to fail, learn from it. So kind of be, be um, really intentional about what you're trying to do and, and how you're trying to accomplish it, and I think that helps to sustain um, these, these local collaboratives. I'd love to take some questions from the audience, and I'm sure we have a, a hand right back here, uh, right in the middle. Just keep your hand up, sir. We'll go find you. Um, Jill, I have to find them. Yeah. Well, can only <laughs> <laughs> oh, the lights are on. This, oh, is, this is much better. <laughs> oh. Hi, sir. What's your name? Uh, SB Chatterjee. Uh, I would like to thank the panel. Uh, great discussion. Very informative. Uh, <clears throat> my questions uh, really. Uh, target for Dr. Bynum. Mm -hmm. It's about social impact investing, mm -hmm. uh, pay for performance financing. Mm -hmm. Why don't we see that more in uh, healthcare in, in interventions, so especially in matters of health disparities, mm -hmm. where basically the the project gets fun, uh, gets the money after we see a move in the needle, yeah. uh, get it down? Because we see relentless financing and grant making. Uh, and grant giving and so on, but yet the equity needle, the disparity needle doesn't move. Mm -hmm. So why don't we see those kind of financing much more in the mm -hmm. healthcare arena? Well, uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges around um, you know, providers uh, not wanting to be on the hook for some things they feel like they can't control. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, uh, when we uh, finance a project, you basically sign three documents. You sign a f financial commitment, you've borrowed X number of dollars, this is the repayment plan, you know, that's a piece. Secondly, you sign a healthcare uh, agreement. These are the types of patients I will see. These are the types of health, out impact, health outcome impacts I will have throughout the term of this loan. And then thirdly, you sign a jobs piece. You know, these are the types of folks I'll employ. These are the types of wages I'll offer. These are the training programs that I'll offer. So for us, we want to create uh, agreements, not only financially, but we want to understand what are the health impacts of this project that we're financing. We want to understand what are the particular job impacts of this piece of financing. So for us, we, we are very, very particular around not only making sure that the finance agreement lines up, but the health outcome agreements as well as the jobs agreement also lines up as well. Hi, sir. What's your name? <clears throat> Hi, my name is Len Johns, and I'm a healthcare <clears throat> educator. And as we're talking about collaborations, the one thing that was uh, that was missing from the conversation, and maybe it wasn't part of the, the goal of the conversation, was what are the collaborations that are going on with healthcare systems and healthcare education folks, mm -hmm. right? Because some of the, and, and to be very specific about it, um, some of the things this transformation is going on around the country, there are a number uh, of colleagues uh, that I talk to across the country, and some of the issues, or one of the big issues, is a lot of systems as they're changing, yeah. they're actually excluding um, uh, clinical possibilities for students. Hmm. Um, so while it's a short-term short -term potential benefit for the system, Right, looking at that long-term piece of now bringing in new educator, I mean, new um, healthcare professionals, whatever profession they are, um, they're losing, or we're losing, right, from from an educational point of view, transitioning these new healthcare professionals into the system. Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question, and something that Colorado certainly struggles with—the clinical placement bottleneck. Um, we call it. So I think they're, um, they have to be part of the conversation. We have to, again, I think, um, you know, we have to think about it as a system. And we have to think about if we make this change over here, what change does it create over here that actually has a negative impact on what we're trying to accomplish overall? So, you know, I don't have a great answer. I think that's a huge issue. I know that we are looking at how we can, can almost do like a, um, 
almost a retail strategy, go one-on-one -on -one with some of the, the systems and providers um, and support um, a nonprofit organization in our state to really advocate with them directly about the importance of, ta of taking those clinical placements can, to the system overall, um, which is not, you know, it's not a, it's not the silver bullet for sure. Um, but I do think it speaks to really broadening the conversation and making sure that all aspects of the system and, um, and beyond are really involved in the conversation so that you can see those adverse impacts as they occur and then figure out, okay, now this is happening. What can we do to address that? Any other thoughts from the panel? Um, and I don't know if this fits, so, so I'll, I'll just throw it out here quickly. Um, I've actually had a couple of conversations with uh, FQHCs who uh, were quite frankly unhappy with kind of the neighborhood community clinics education of their MAs, dental assistants, and community health workers. And there's one particular FQ that wants to stand up an educational platform where they take on that responsibility, where they want to create a six, nine-month curriculum where they begin to certify MAs, DAs, community health workers. That's embedded and taught through their clinical model, which they feel like, one, um, is a better educational experience for these mid-level sort of frontline type workers. But then, two, they want to price this where these local high school graduates are taking on a fifth or a sixth of the death, the debt that they would have taken on had they gone the community college route mm -hmm. if they go this route. So they feel like they're one, taking high school graduates, uh, giving them a better clinical experience in terms of training them, but then secondly, uh, avoiding you know mm -hmm. tens of thousands of debt, dollars in debt in terms of getting a, a credential certificate. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Go ahead, sir. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Steve Smith. I'm a family physician at the Community Health Center in New London. The uh, ACA requires now that hospitals uh, undertake a community health needs assessment. And it seems to me that that might be a perfect uh, opportunity for collaboration. So I wanted to know if any of the panelists, one, have had experience with that, and number two, any lessons to be learned or recommendations to make that a uh, true collaborative and, and very effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Diane? That's a great question. I have not personally had um, experience with that. I know that um, some of our regional collaboratives have. Um, uh, New York State has uh, Finger Lakes Health uh, S Services Agency is one of the collaboratives, and um, but I, I can't point to more information than that. I'm I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'll mention a, an initiative that we um, funded. It's called the Build Health Challenge, and Build stands for Bold. Um, upstream, innovative, <laughs> local, and data-driven. Um, it is, a, I know, <laughs> it's impressive, huh? <laughs> I've seen longer acronyms, but um, there, it, uh, it is a multi-funder national uh, collaborative involving um, the De Beaumont Foundation Advisory Board Company, Kresge, Robert Wood Johnson, the Colorado Health Foundation is a state state level funder involved in the collaborative. And it's really focused on the partnerships between health systems and community-based organizations and local public health. And I think underlying the, um, the initiative is this idea that hospitals um, now are required to do the community health needs assessments. How can we support those partnerships to make sure that those community health needs assessment as assessments reflect the needs of the community and are put into action, that there's an action plan in place to address what's identified in those, those needs assessments. So it might be something to check out. Um, there could be additional um, opportunities within the Build Health Challenge coming up, I'm, I'm not sure, um, but something to, to pay attention to. Let's see, oh, we got a question over here and then a question right on the row down here. Just as a, as a comment, I run a health system. And so we did our community health needs assessment and um, that itself, creates the conversation, mm -hmm. which is really, I think, the key part of it is you're bringing stakeholders from all these agencies throughout the community into that conversation. And as a consequence, I would say starting that dialogue, which doesn't really cost anything, has uh, re resulted in amazing benefits. So, Great. Thank you. We have a question right here along the row. Hi. Hi, I'm Karen Lanawet. It's not actually a question, it's a point of information, which is that when hospitals do community health needs assessments, they're now required to do community health Im implementation plans. So they do have to create a plan based on the assessment that they did. And then they have to report that plan to the IRS, and so there is, it has to be an active living plan. 
Okay. I'm going to give it to the woman in the flowers first because she has <laughs> Hello, wo woman with Hi. flowers. <laughs> Hello. I'm also known as Rachel, but you can call me. Hi, forever. Rachel. <laughs> um, I'm really curious about, um, in collaboration, making sure that the community, um, the consumer voice around the table includes, you know, man on the street, a lot of different types of consumers. And I'm curious if you have encountered any good strategies for including linguistic diversity, people who don't speak English as a second language, either um, because of immigration or because of deaf or hard of hearing status. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I have a, yeah. and that, that's, a that's a great point. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer for that, but that's a, something definitely to, to think about in terms of collaboration. I, I think it's absolutely critically important as it, we talked about earlier and no great strategies to offer other than to say again, I think it's incumbent upon um, you know, the people who are bringing these collaboratives together to be really intentional about that and really figure out what kind? What strategies will engage um, different populations? Because it's not the same. A meeting at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday morning is probably not going to engage certain populations. Um, those who are um, can't leave work to be, you know, the consumer representative uh, on this particular advisory committee or that kind of thing. So I think using focus groups, using um, surveys and polling where those are appropriate, um, going to where people are, and and just asking the question is really important and then making sure that there's that 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 information is reflected back and taken back to the conversation in um, an authentic way is really important as well so I wish I had some great strategies I would just acknowledge that it's a critically important issue and we've got it we've got to work on that okay we have one, one here and then Jill, uh, we have I've one. I've been serving with a health neighborhood which has brought together uh, all the people who touch patients on an outpatient basis. Mm -hmm. uh, skilled nursing facilities, um, uh, the housing authority, uh, the visiting nurse association, uh, and to a person or representative, we have all felt that uh, a major issue is communication. We none of us get information from the hospitals on, or very little information from the hospitals on discharge, from uh, admission or discharge from the skilled nursing facilities. Uh, and the, there's not a lot of information uh, exchange between physicians and visiting nurses, for example. Uh, are any of you, uh, and a lot of it, has to do with uh, barriers to communication that are endemic to the health system. Everybody has a different computer and they don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. I, I have yet to see a sustained regional, local, or national effort to remedy this. If, the, if there is any free-floating funds uh, among any of you, <laughs> I think that is a real target uh, that would really significantly yeah. improve the healthcare yeah. system. Thank you very much for that. Do you, do you have a thought? Yeah, I have a thought. So, so um, regional collaboratives look at, are, are trying to look at what, what do we really want to measure as outcomes? What's important to us? And if you... Um, kind of measure what matters to the community, you can often change behavior. So um, I know this is not exactly what, what you're talking about, but one of the, we, we brought together several users, including employers, providers, and consumers and patients and said, what measures are really important to you? Is it control, you know, for diabetes, your A1C, is that, does that really move you? Or would it be kind of shared decision making? You know, is, is that something that's going to resonate with you more as a, as a patient, as a human, that conversation you're having with your provider or talking about end of life care issues, having that conversation? And can we somehow measure those, um, you know, kind of non-traditional me uh, measures, but can we look at those and, and then shed light on them and, and, and through measurement try to kind of change and change behavior, if that makes sense. Any other thoughts? No. 
Not about free-flowing funds to support it. But <laughs> <laughs> necessary. Please. Yeah, please. Yeah, just on that point, uh, in, in Maryland, we have a very active uh, and functional uh, health uh, information exchange mm -hmm. known as CRISP. Mm -hmm. uh, and today, uh, it has been, it's been funded through the hospitals and the, uh, and the payers. Today, if you're a primary care provider and you've registered uh, with CRISP, uh, you get uh, an automatic uh, uh, message the moment one of your patients is admitted to a hospital, you get a message the moment uh, the patient is discharged. We're working on uh, exchange, the free flow of exchange of information about uh, the discharge summary that comes back uh, then uh, and engaging other components of it. It's not easy work, but we are doing that through uh, this health information exchange to solve the very problem that you've, you've talked about. And I should say in Colorado, there's a group called Quality Health Network that looks to do sort of that same kind of connective tissue issue across a continuum. So that, that's a group in Colorado maybe, maybe you should, should check out a little bit. Quality Health Network. Go ahead, sir. Yes, uh, Ken Lillian from Healthy CT. Um, we talked about the difference between uh, health and health care and the unknown differences. And then there's the other one of public health and health care. All seems to get back to health literacy. Mm -hmm. And all these things, I mean, we all sit in this room and we all know what we're all talking about. The general consumer doesn't know the difference between all those. And, and before we put public policy on top of uh, that difficulty, I think we really have to make a major initiative. And it's going to take a generation to, to make those changes, but it's got to be embedded in school systems. It's got to be embedded in every one of our organizations that true health literacy will bring around more cost savings than anything else. You know, you can boil it down to people don't know how to take, you know, look at their EOB or take a look at their benefits or whatever. So if, for each of you, has that come up as an opportunity in each of your areas? And is there anything that's being done that you know of to really progressively change the, the literacy level? I, ju I, I just find it remarkable. The last three questions have all been about communication. <laughs> I mean, they, they've all been about... Yeah. People speaking different languages, not understanding uh, perhaps what we're all talking about here today. Yeah. I, I understand less about what we're talking about here today than anybody else in the room. <laughs> <laughs> have we made sense? Uh, yes. For the yeah, yes, you have mostly for the most part. I especially like the part about the money. Uh, excuse me, please continue. Yeah. I, I knew you wanted to answer. So, uh, yes, yeah, so let me just take a, a stab at this. So, um, I, again, from the regional collaborative perspective, um, it's a lot about data. And if um, so, so right or wrong, but um, so public reporting of performance of um, physicians or practices, clinics, that plays a, a huge role um, in getting consumers information. And I, and I know you're thinking, that's not health literacy. Um, so, but, but it's a piece of it, is, is trying to say, at least get consumers to think that quality is different, that not all physicians are the same and value is different. And so by posting some of that information online, by pushing it out to people, by getting it in um, articles of local newspapers, I think regional collaboratives are trying to engage um, consumers in, in health. I, I think it is su such a challenge and a conundrum. I, I admit we have not solved this. It's, it's going to take But time. you wandered into the one part that I do know something about, which is you're talking oh, about... No. <laughs> But it's telling a story about it. And I yes. think that that's, yeah. that's what you, if you yeah. have data, then you can tell a story about data that people will understand, they can help make decisions about yeah. it, right? I mean, yeah. um, I guess taking my VCAP hat off for a bit, um, I'm on the board of the National School Based Health Alliance, where the mission is to marry health centers with schools in low income areas. And one of the big pieces of the work that the alliance does is education. You know, starting in the school, starting at a young age, talking about your body, talking about preventive care, talking about how you access the healthcare system. So I think there are some pieces of that being done, uh, but is it happening enough? No. Uh, but it is a piece that uh, folks are being intentional about because they do realize it's 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 a big piece of the pie that we need to we need to be engaged in. Mm -hmm. 
Amy, can I ask you yeah. uh, have the last word on this? Because yeah, you know. health literacy is a really important and a very complicated issue, and something we think about all the time, um, in all of our in all of our work for sure. I think we think about it from a couple of different perspectives. Number one, individuals need to be engaged in their own health care and health decision making, um, and so that's one piece of it. And I think there's ways to do that that include both education, but also incentives like choosing wisely and um, other things that we can think about in terms of individuals um, engaging in their own health care. We have to make the system easier to navigate for consumers. I mean, I think it's, if we're talking about educating consumers to understand the system, well, I don't understand the system and this is my job, you know? So I think this is, I think we have to be, we have to, to really think about it from both perspectives, that it's, there is this piece about engaging people in their individual health decision making. There's certainly the piece about engaging consumers in policy and decision making that affects them as, as, um, uh, members of the system, for sure, that's critically important. But the average person on the street probably shouldn't have to understand the intricacies of the healthcare financing and delivery model. They just need good health care and they want to be healthy. And so I think it's just thinking about it, you know, what exactly are we talking about with health literacy? Because um, just educating people, you know, to, to kind of bring them to a level of understanding may not get us to where we want to go. It's a great point, a very important issue. We have time for one last question. Hi, my name is Susan Kelly. I'm with NAMI Connecticut, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, uh, thank you very much, for, um, all of your, uh, this has been terrific. Um, my question has to do with, in each of your areas, um, how you are addressing the integration of be behavioral health care and challenges that you might be facing, um, particularly interested on the community model. Um, you know, Ben was talking very, he, that was a very interesting comment you made about getting elderly folks, mm -hmm. um, you know, to uh, be able to lower their depression scores and so forth. Um, Pueblo would be, I'm very curious as well, and I'm sorry I'm the last question because it's lunchtime, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, who wants to tackle this first? Maybe hear from everybody. Um, sure, I'll, I'll briefly. Uh, the whole uh, initiative of SIM in the state of Colorado is integrating physical health and behavioral health. And uh, I've been in some very interesting cities in Colorado these last few weeks, uh, talking to providers, asking them, what are your challenges to do this? Uh, and folks have sorts, all sorts of different challenges from you know, building a new site that supports a kind of a pod team-based approach to uh, renovating a clinic that particularly their, their, their docs have been sitting in these cuticle silos and now they want to sort of renovate that space where it fits more of a team-based approach. Uh, folks have new IT, mm -hmm. new IT systems. I can't build for the physical health stuff I see. I can't build for the behavioral stuff I see. Uh, other folks have workforce solutions where they can't find uh, this type of provider that can provide this services that's needed in the community. So I think depending on what who you're talking to, kind of what's their organizational capacity, what's their uh, geographic capacity. If you're in a metro area, you may have a model that works this way. If you're out and you're the only provider sort of within a 30 mile radius, then you're, you know, you may have to go to more of a virtual model for some of your, some of your services. So I think, you know, depending on who you're talking to, that pain point could be totally different and tailoring that solution to whatever challenges that provider sees is kind of more of the, the, the challenge than figuring out a, a, a one size fits all. A last thought about yeah, I'll just speak um, to, to follow up on what Ben said. I agree with everything he mentioned. And just in terms of the workforce, it's not just finding the providers. Um, you know, there's certainly a lack of providers in many communities in our states, both on the, the physical health side and the behavioral health side. But it's also finding providers who are comfortable um, in that integrated setting. It's a very different model of care delivery for some <laughs> behavioral health providers than what they were trained to do. So we're really looking at um, programs, creating a consistent set of standards, training standards for um, providers in those integrated settings, and then how we can provide support that retraining um, that's necessary for providers to um, deliver care in an integrated environment. Uh, Amy, Ben, and Diane, thank you all very much. Thank you for the great questions, and thank you so much to the Universal Healthcare Foundation. Um, thanks for coming.